Okay, so welcome to the first virtual lecture of the semester. Today uh, we are going to talk about I/O systems, and uh, uh, to, uh, as we have done in the past, today's lecture is going to be on general concepts, and then next time we are going to talk about minix specific I/O uh, I/O systems and concepts. So in today's class, I'm going to cover a few things. First is uh, um, how I/O hardware has influenced the design of operating systems, how I/O services are provided by an OS, how does the OS implement those services, and how can the I/O performance be improved by the OS. So let's start with the basics. Um, if you remember, in the uh, very first few lectures, I presented you a slide that showed basic architectural concepts. So we are going to visit that again, uh, but look at it from the perspective of I.O. devices and I.O. subsystem. So if you remember, um, the key components of that figure included a system bus, it included the CPU, it included memory, and it included I.O. devices. And the system bus was the interface or the interconnect that allowed the processor to communicate with memory for I/O devices to communicate with uh, the CPU as well as read or write data from uh, from uh, memory. So, keeping that picture in mind, and I'm going to show you that picture again in just a minute. Uh, the key components that we are going to focus on now are the I/O devices themselves. So, a typical I/O device. Uh, uses what is called a port mapped I.O. And later on we'll see a different method of performing I.O. called memory mapped I.O. as well. So for now, uh, assuming a port mapped I.O. Uh, 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 architecture, each device is going to be assumed to have four registers for communication. Uh, this includes the status register, uh, which is uh, used to convey the status of the device to the processor and the status could be busy, it could be ready, or it could be an error. Um, then there's a control register, which is where the CPU will write the control command to the I.O. device. Typically, it could be a read or a write command. And then there's a data in register for uh, sending data uh, from the device to the CPU, and the data out register, where the data is being sent from the CPU to the device. So. Uh, so th those are the four registers, and then we have the controller itself for each device. Now the controller is going to receive commands from the processor, which is written to the control register, uh, and then is going to translate them to device actions. And we are going to uh, cover I/O uh, concepts very broadly. So this is going to apply to all kinds of devices, everything from the disk, uh, printers, keyboard mice, uh, displays, and things of that sort, as well as all kinds of non-traditional I.O. devices, such as joysticks or touch surfaces and things of that sort. So, so here's the picture I wanted to show you, which is the uh, a slightly modified version of the picture we have seen before. Uh, so here we have the processor, we have the memory, and we have the system bus. But now, uh, looking at the I.O. devices themselves, we'll see that there are a number of them here. Uh, each I.O. device actually has a controller and then there's the device itself. So all communication with the I.O. device actually happens through the controller for that specific device. So each device is going to have a controller, uh, which is what is being used to communicate to that device. So looking at that picture in a little more detail, uh, that part of the system bus that is used to communicate with I.O. devices could include what's called the PCI bus, which is a peripheral bus. Uh, there are other kinds of buses that are also used for I.O. communication, uh, such as the USB bus and uh, others, and they will connect typically to, say, a PCI bus. Um, now, as you can see, the same concepts apply here. Uh, this is part of the system bus that is specifically uh, being used for I.O. communication. And you will see in this picture that there is, uh, for, for every device, there's a controller. Right? So for the graphics card, there's a graphics controller. And uh, uh, for the disk, 
which is shown as an IDE disk here, there's an IDE controller. Now keep in mind that certain controllers can actually communicate with multiple devices. Uh, every device needs a controller, but some controllers can control multiple devices, not just one. An example here is the SCSI controller uh, that communicates with multiple SCSI uh, disks and there's a SCSI bus that is used to communicate with these disks and there is also an ID controller shown here which is used to control multiple uh, disks in this case and if you remember uh, uh, how you the USB ports look on your machine there is a there may be multiple ports so you can communicate with multiple USB devices using a USB bus and a USB controller. So there are many kinds of I.O. devices that you will see on a typical machine and uh, they will range from things like a keyboard, a mouse, to a graphics card, to the network interface cards uh, and so on. Um, and the, uh, all I.O. devices are typically slow but uh, the speeds can vary dramatically by orders of magnitude and that is what this, uh, this slide shows. You will see things like keyboard which might receive uh, as few as 10 bytes per second depending on how fast you can type and then you have things like the gigabit ethernet card on your machine where the communication is much faster uh, you can have up to 125 megabits per second which is around a gigabit uh, per second and so on so so vast differences in speeds but nevertheless by and large they're still slower than the processor and the memory on your machine now if you take a look at the kernel I.O. subsystem which is in the OS, you will see that the way these devices interface with the rest of the OS uh, includes two layers. Uh, there is a device independent layer which is called the kernel I.O. subsystem in this picture and that is used to communicate with devices in a somewhat independent fashion, independent of the specifics of the devices themselves and underneath the uh, device independent layer is the device dependent layer and these are all device drivers. So each device driver has all of the code needed to communicate with that specific device. So it encodes most of the device specific characteristics. So, so requests come through the kernel to the device independent sub IO subsystem and then they are sent to the device driver for communication with the actual device for reading or writing from that actual device and, and as you know the device driver is really the lowest layer of the kernel that is used to interface with all kinds of IO devices and there has to be a device driver again for each device IO device in the system. So as I mentioned earlier uh, each device has ports or registers that are used to communicate with it and ports are essentially addressed. Just as you have memory addresses and you have each memory location has an address that is used to communicate with that uh, memory device, so do I.O. devices. Each of the ports of the I.O. device essentially has an address and that's the address that is going to be used to communicate with that device. And uh, as it turns out on most uh, of the Intel architectures or, or, or on Intel architecture as well as most of the other architectures, um, but these I.O. addresses are also pre-allocated for certain kinds of devices. So for example, uh, as is shown in this figure, uh, the first range of addresses which is 0 through F are reserved for DMA controllers and then you might have um, the serial ports have a certain address range and so on. So if you have those devices, those are the address ranges that are used for those devices for communication by the device driver. Now uh, going back a layer up to the OS, uh, there are several I.O. services that an OS is going to provide. Uh, there are high level services uh, such as file system services that, that we'll get to in a couple of lectures that are provided where you might have things like naming files and, um, uh, and so on. Um, now as it turns out, uh, uh, I.O. devices in, in Unix are also given a file-like abstraction. So all I.O. devices essentially as, uh, appear as files. They are in the slash dev directory of a, a Unix file system uh, or our Minix file system. And these are the devices, uh, these devices have specific names like slash dev slash mouse, which will allow you to 
figure out what the device is and that is the device name that is used for communication by application. So, so on Unix devices appear as files in the slash dev directory. There's access control which is the same uh, method that is used for files where you have read write uh, permissions that tell you whether you can read or write to a device uh, by specific users or app processes on your machine. Uh, we, the other services that we'll get to also include uh, allocating addresses for devices, buffering, caching uh, for efficient communication. There's things like I/O scheduling, which is uh, useful when there are multiple users accessing the device, and then there are device drivers that provide services for uh, accessing that device using device-specific characteristics. So we'll now talk a little bit about various ways by which. Uh, I.O. communication occurs and so the way to think about this is uh, how do device drivers actually work and there are uh, three things we are going to look at. Uh, the first one which is the simplest is uh, you implementing device drivers using polling. Uh, so this is the simplest method where uh, the CPU is going to use the four registers on that I.O. Uh, device and use those registers for communicating with the device. So, so there are a number of steps that a CPU has to go through in order to read or write to a device. So, so let's assume that you would like to uh, write to a uh, one byte to a device, uh, to an I/O device. So the way the process works is the device driver is going to essentially uh, busy wait uh, and keep polling the status register until the device is idle. Once the device is idle, the next I.O. operation can start and the device driver through the CPU is going to write a command to the register, uh, to the command register and in this case it's the write command and uh, then it's also going to write the byte that it wishes to output to the data out register because if you're going to write, you have to actually tell the device what you're writing to it. And then it is going to set the status register to command ready, which tells the controller that the CPU has actually, the device driver through the CPU has uh, sent a new command to this device. So once the controller receives this command or sees that command in the register, it's going to set the status register to busy, which means now it's executing that IO operation. And then the controller is going to read the command register, see that this is a write command. It's going to take the byte from the data out register, and then it's going to essentially try to write to that IO device. If the operation succeeds, the controller is going to then say uh, that it has succeeded by, by setting the status to idle and uh, in the CPU in the meantime is essentially the device driver in the CPU uh, which is executing on the CPU in the meanwhile is simply polling the device in a busy wait fashion. It's just checking uh, the, the status register to see if it is actually uh, completed, uh, the controller has completed the IO command. Um, and if so, then you can start the next command and so on. So, so if you're trying to read one byte uh, to, a, to, a, uh, to a device, this is the way you're going to implement a device driver. But as you can see, since IO devices are themselves slow, this might take a while for the IO operation to complete. In the meantime, the CPU is just sitting there busy waiting, which is going to waste CPU cycles. So we need a better method to implement these device drivers, which gets us to the next one. So this is the simplest method, it's called polling. Uh, a, a better method that reduces uh, or eliminates busy wait is to use interrupts. So in this case, uh, all of the operations that we talked about on the previous slides will still hold, uh, but what is going to happen is the device driver is no longer going to busy wait, waiting for that command to complete. Instead, it is going to wait for an interrupt. So, so in this case, the device driver will output the command uh, to the command register. It's going to write the byte it needs to output to the device, uh, to the output register. And then it's just going to uh, 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 allow the CPU to execute other things. And once the device has finished its operation, it is going to raise an interrupt. At this point, you're going to uh, basically uh, use the interrupt vector, come back to the kernel uh, and then you're going to go back to the interrupt handler which is in the device driver and then essentially see what the status of the command was and say it is completed and then start the next operation. 
So, so what interrupts allow you to do in this case is to reduce or eliminate in this case uh, the Z weight. So your uh, oper IO operations are more efficient. There is no wasting of CPU cycles. Uh, and we have seen interrupts before and the same concepts are going to be used here where you have an interrupt vector or a table where you have interrupt handlers, pre-registers, there are specific ones uh, for I.O. operations. There are many other kinds of interrupts, but the ones we care about here are for I.O. operations. So we are going to use those within the device drivers to allow communication with I.O. devices. So moving on, the third type of device driver or I.O. method that we are going to look at is called direct memory access or DMA. Uh, now, the previous two methods, which is polling and interrupt based I.O., uh, both assume that mm -hmm. you are communicating with I.O. devices one byte at a time. And if you have simple devices like keyboard, where you might be typing, uh, that is okay. Uh, but there are many devices where you might have to transfer large volumes of data. Examples could be a disk where you are trying to read or write blocks or larger files or the graphics card where you might be outputting an entire screen worth of pixels out to the monitor. Uh, in this case, trying to read or write one byte at a time is going to be an extremely wasteful and also very slow. So, so we need a better, better method for larger volume of I.O. So that method is referred to as DMA or direct memory access. And as the name suggests, uh, what we have in this case is an additional I.O. controller called the can read or write directly to memory. So in this case, rather than using a data in and data out register, a DMA controller is an address register. So the CPU is going to tell the controller what command it wants to issue, maybe it's read or write, and then it uh, points the DMA controller to a location in memory. So if you're trying to write to a device, you'll write that data to a a buff, uh, to a block in memory and then provide that address to the DMA controller. And then once the DMA controller starts executing that operation, it's simply going to read data from memory and directly output it without the CPU uh, in, the, in the loop. So the CPU is no longer going to be part of the I.O. operation, it's essentially being performed by the DMA controller. So in this case, the DMA acts like a proxy for the CPU. The CPU is no longer in the I.O. path once the command has been issued and data is either being written directly from RAM to the device or data is being read from the device into the RAM without the CPU. And the CPU can then execute other things in the meanwhile. Uh, so the one thing to keep in mind is that the device, DMA controller and the CPU are going to compete on the, uh, on the system bus for uh, memory access because the CPU is now executing other processes and it might have to fetch data or instructions from RAM and the DMA controller is executing I.O. operations so it's also going to read or write from RAM. But the system bus is going to arbitrate this concurrent access for us and this is still more efficient than having the CPU be involved in every byte of I.O. So here's a picture that shows us how that process that I described actually works. So you have step one is the CPU is going to issue a command to the DMA controller and that command is going to be either read or write and then you have to specify a memory address where the DMA controller can read or write a chunk of memory. So you basically give it an address and the size and then the DMA controller in this case is trying to uh, read or write a block of memory to a disk or write, uh, read or write to disk. So it's going to take that request, it is going to then take that chunk of memory and then either write it to disk or it's going to read from disk and then write to that block of memory. And once all that is done, it's going to interrupt the CPU like before and then the CPU can look at the status of the command and if the data has been successfully read or written, it can then move on to the next command. So uh, with, with these three methods in mind, which include polling, intra-based and DMA-based communication, let's look at some other services and abstractions that an OS is going to provide. So the OS provides a much higher level abstraction for, of devices. 
and typically uh, much of the the low level details are encapsulated in the device driver and the device independent layer within the OS is going to use even higher level abstractions to read or write to these devices. Uh, so, uh, so each device is abstracted using a few different uh, dimensions. The first one is uh, what is the unit of transfer? Is are you reading or writing a byte of memory, a byte of data to the other device, or are you reading or writing entire blocks? And depending on which of the two it is, the device either becomes a character-based device or a block-based device. Character-based devices are ones where you're reading or writing one byte at a time. Examples of these would include things like the keyboard, the mice, and so on. And block-based devices are ones where you are reading or writing entire blocks of memory. The second characteristic of a device is whether it is sequential or uh, random. In sequential mode, you are reading or writing sequentially. So uh, again, keyboard, you are going to read a sequential stream of uh, input from the keyboard to the machine. And uh, uh, But whereas for disk, you can read or write to any location on disk, so it's a random access device. So the timing uh, of how you are going to perform this I.O. is also a characteristic of the device where you can be synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous essentially means blocking communication to the device and asynchronous essentially means you can issue a command and then uh, you can essentially go off and do other things, so it's non-blocking I.O. Uh, devices can be shared or dedicated. Uh, there is also the speed of the device depending on the type of the device. And uh, the more other important characteristic is whether it's an input device and output device or both. Things like disk, you can read or write, uh, but in case of a keyboard, you're only going to read. It doesn't make any sense to write to a keyboard. Uh, or the graphics card is essentially an output device where you're going to write, but you cannot read from a, uh, from a typical monitor. Unless, of course, you are a touch screen, in which case you can output and input from the screen as well. So, so as I shown in the at uh, the bottom here, uh, depending on the type of device, you will get a different uh, classification. So, for example, a keyboard is a sequential device that's character based. A disk is a block device that could be written either randomly or you can also have sequential reads or writes to a disk. Okay. So, so the types of devices and their characteristics are also shown in an example here where uh, some of the examples I mentioned are already there. There are several others here. So, so for example, uh, the transfer mode, if it's character based, you have things like terminals and keyboard, it's block based, it's disk. The access method is sequential. You will have things like a modem or a keyboard again. And if it's random, you will have things like disks and CD-ROMs. The transfer methodology is synchronous. You will have things like tape devices. If it's asynchronous, which means non-blocking, you will have keyboard devices. Uh, I.O. devices could be shared or dedicated. Uh, shared devices could include things like disk, and dedicated ones could be things like tape. Our uh, device speed would include characteristics like the latency, the seek time, the transfer rate, the delay between operations and so on. And last uh, but not least, with that, uh, depending on whether the device is read-only, such as a CD-ROM, write-only, such as a graphics controller or read-write, such as a disk, you'll have, again, different kinds of devices. Let's take a look at um, block-based and character-based devices in a little bit uh, more detail. And then when we come to Minix-specific uh, uh, the lecture next time, we are going to go into this law into a lot more detail and look at how the device drivers themselves are implemented for block and character-based devices. So as I said before, block-based devices include things like disk drives. The commands that you issue to block-based devices are things like read, write, seek, and so on. Uh, and then uh, depending on whether the I.O. is itself raw, which means you're reading or writing raw blocks, or file-based, which means you're actually reading or writing files, and the file system layer within the OS is then going to translate them to raw commands. So you will have different kinds of accesses. Uh, we might also have memory mapped I.O. Uh, to files, which I'm going to get to in a, in a later slide. Uh, or you can directly use uh, DMA-based communication. 
Now, if your character devices such as keyboards, mouse, serial ports and so on, the commands are going to, at a higher level, the commands are going to be get or put, which then at a lower level essentially become read or write to the command registers. And then there are libraries that may be layered on top that allow you to um, read, write uh, to these devices. Now, uh, an important characteristic of all of these device drivers is to somehow manage the mismatch between the speed of the I.O. device on one hand and the speed of the processor on the other. And as I showed you earlier, there is going to be devices with very different types of uh, uh, characteristics and very uh, that operate at very uh, different speeds. And then there's a processor which typically ends up being much faster than most of these devices. So an important question an OS designer has to address is how are you going to manage this mismatch because the device might be reading or writing at certain speed which is very different from the rate at which a CPU might be reading or writing to memory. So, so this is handled through a technique called buffering where you have pieces of memory both on the device uh, itself and also some memory that is used on by the OS on RAM that is going to be used to manage this mismatch. So, so on the device side, you have I.O. buffering where you have a small piece of memory on the device. So the device will then read or write from that memory and then the controller is going to provide that to uh, that uh, whatever has been read, uh, read or written into that mem piece of memory to, to, the, uh, to the OS and then the applications. So, uh, in case of a disk, for example, you will have a disk buffer on, on the hard, hard drive itself, which is where you are going to first read or write uh, uh, things and then uh, the disk controller and the DMA controller will read from that memory buffer and then transfer it to a, a buffer in physical memory. And then the DMA controller is going to interrupt the CPU when it's done. Uh, if you have simpler devices where you have the data in or data out registers, that is basically the memory on the device. But, but for other more sophisticated devices, you have more memory. For example, another example is a graphics card where specs for the graphics card will tell you how much memory is on that graphics card, which acts as the buffer as well. Now, uh, in addition to the buffer on the device side, there's also going to be a buffer on the OS side, which is essentially going to be a memory buffer that the OS manages. And this is again to deal with speed mismatches. So, so what would happen in this case is you are going to read or write to your memory buffer and then if you're doing DMA, you're going to tell the uh, DMA controller to read or write from that buffer and send that data to the device or if you're reading data from the device to first put that data in the buffer before telling the CPU that the operation has completed. So this is going to minimize the time where the CPU has to be in the loop for, um, for communication with the IO, IO device. Now, this, interestingly on the OS side, this buffer is also going to act as a cache, which means that all recently read or written data to the device is going to be also held in the buffer for some period of time. It's not like for once you have finished an I.O. operation, the data in the buffer is discarded, you're going to keep it in the cache. Now the most useful uh, purpose of having the cache is the file system, which does a lot of I.O. to the disk. So by keeping data in the cache, you can reduce the number of slower disk operations. And the idea is whenever uh, our process is trying to read a file, you are going to first see if the disk blocks of that file are first in the OS buffer cache. If so, your operation can be satisfied directly from the buffer cache. And only if you have a cache miss, are you essentially going to go to the disk to retrieve that data. So the two examples shown here are what happens when you issue a read or a write command to the disk. So the first step is always to check whether uh, the data is in the cache in the case of a read operation. So as is shown here, if the block is in memory, you're just going to return the block from memory, which is from the buffer cache. Otherwise, you're going to actually issue a read operation to the, uh, to the disk. Now in case of write, uh, what you can do is, uh, you can essentially take the write uh, operation and then essentially write it to the buffer cache and then return. 
um, and later on you can actually flush that uh, block to disk. Now depending on whether you do that or you actually directly write to uh, your disk, you are going to get two types of caching policies. And I mentioned these two caching policies also earlier in the course and they are referred to as write through or write back. In the write through policy, when you have a write operation, you are going to write the cache but also write to the disk at the same time. So the data propagates all the way through the cache to the I.O. device. In the write back policy, the data is actually written to the cache, the buffer cache and the write operation returns and the, the process is given the impression that the write operation is completed. But the write has actually only gone to the uh, buffer cache and at a later point OS is going to flush that to uh, flush that written block or the dirty block to, to the disk. Now there are trade-offs between uh, the write through policy and the write back policy. The write through policy is more reliable because all I.O. operations immediately get sent to the I.O. device. This way if the machine has a failure then the, any unwritten data that's in the buffer cache is not lost unlike in the write back policy. The write back policy because you are writing data to the buffer cache and then uh, writing it to the I.O. device at a later time. If you have a failure of the OS or a power failure, then any unwritten data to the device is going to be lost even though the, the op, uh, applications have been told that the operation has actually completed. So write back policies are faster, they are a performance optimization, but they are less reliable than the write through policies. Many file systems today still use the write back policy because uh, they uh, they optimize or the trade-off that they go for is performance over reliability which is better from an uh, applications perspective but occasionally when there are failures you might have uh, loss of unwritten blocks from, you know, on your file system. So if you now try to put all of these things together, uh, what is a typical read call is shown in this picture. Okay, so this is a DMA based IO. So the user process is going to request a read from a device. Uh, the OS is first going to check if the data is already in its buffer cache. If so, you have a cache hit, the read operation can uh, return and there is no communication with the I.O. device. But if there is a cache miss, then the OS has to tell the device driver to perform a read. Uh, the device driver is going to invoke the DMA controller. It's going to essentially uh, give it the address of the block to be read and it's going to point it to a block of memory in RAM or in the buffer cache where that data has to be put. And then uh, the CPU then goes off, does other things, executes other processes and in the meantime the DMA controller is going to essentially transfer the data from the disk to the kernel buffer, uh, well from the disk first to the disk buffer and from the disk buffer to the kernel buffer. And then once that operation is completed, it's going to send an interrupt to the processor. Uh, that's going to cause the, uh, the interrupt handler to be invoked. The device driver executes again. It's going to take that uh, uh, data and then hand it to the application and then basically put the process back in the ready queue where it can execute and actually take that uh, uh, red data and do whatever it needed to do. So then the process once it gets scheduled is going to begin execution following the read system call. So this is all the steps that you have to perform going all the way from the application to the OS to the device driver and the device itself for a typical read call. Okay, and so the steps are also shown in this picture. I'm not going to repeat all of the steps again but as you can see you start with the application which is executing on the processor, you first check in the buffer cache which is shown there. Uh, and then if you have a cache hit, you're done. Otherwise, you go send uh, that to the disk controller and the DMA controller which together perform the operation uh, using the memory buffer and then interrupt the CPU once you're done. Okay. So, so this is basically slide is putting all of what I said in this uh, previous few slides together into the request lifecycle uh, for, for IO.
Okay, so you start always with the application process which is triggering the I.O. operation. Typically in this, if you are thinking about file I.O., you have a process that's simply trying to read or write from a file using a user library. The user library makes a system call. Uh, because I.O. operations are sensitive or privileged operation, only the OS can perform it. Uh, the system call essentially then um, invokes the device driver uh, the, within the kernel. The device driver essentially, in this case, if it's a disk operation, is going to invoke the disk controller and the DME controller. The DME controller is going to perform the operation. Uh, I did, uh, may, uh, I did forgot to mention that uh, you will also check the buffer cache before you send that I.O. device, uh, to the I.O. operation to the disk driver. Uh, but once you get to the disk driver, you are going to use the DMA controller and the disk controller to perform the operation. Once the operation completes, you are going to essentially uh, make an interrupt and then uh, hand that block to the process, which can then continue execution from where it was left, where it left off. So, I have one other thing to mention. Uh, all of what we talked about uses a concept called port mapped I.O., where the disks or the devices are assumed to have ports where you are where you're reading or writing to that I.O. device. Another method of I.O., which we really haven't touched upon in this course and we won't do much of this uh, even for Minix, is what is called memory mapped I.O. Now, uh, the, to understand the differences, uh, there are three pictures shown on this slide. Uh, the picture shown A is port mapped I.O. where the memory and I.O. devices have two different and distinct sets of addresses. So remember that memory has address which are memory location and I said I.O. devices are ports, each port also has an address and these are distinct addresses. So port 5 is going to be different from memory address 5 so they so because they are distinct address spaces now that's how port mapped io works or pmio in memory mapped io io devices addressing is integrated with memory addressing so there's a single address space uh, so maybe the first n locations in this case could be memory addresses and the latter locations are essentially addresses that look like memory addresses but essentially are addresses of ports so, in memory mapped I.O., uh, I.O. devices are simply addressed as if you are addressing a memory pointer or memory location. You simply read or write to a memory location uh, which just happens to be a special address. The address actually is an I.O. address and then by in doing so, you are reading or writing to an I.O. device itself. Many embedded devices essentially use memory mapped I.O., but more sophisticated machines essentially provide port mapped I.O. Uh, memory mapped I.O. is much simpler because you do not have to deal with ports or anything like that. You are simply reading or writing memory locations. So all I.O. devices are mapped to some address range which goes beyond the size of physical RAM. So you just extend the memory addresses that you can address and have some of them be I.O. devices. So that is shown in picture B. So in this case, the gray box essentially refers addresses that refer to I.O. devices and the the rest of the box essentially refers to memory addresses. Now many machines are going to also provide a hybrid option which is shown in figure C where they support port mapped as well as memory mapped I.O. So you can use either one uh, depending on which one is more convenient. So you can still use port mapped I.O. to communicate with devices but some devices can be addressed using the memory map mechanism and so that's your hybrid method. Many sophisticated machines essentially allow you to do either one depending on which one is better for the application. So keep that in mind because you know, we have really not talked about how memory mapped I.O. actually works because uh, although you have memory like addresses from an application standpoint, the CPU still has to then take those memory addresses and then read or write or not the CPU rather the OS has to take those memory addresses and then actually read or write to the device underneath. So underneath you still need device drivers and so on to actually do the I.O. It is just a better abstraction for the rest of the kernel and for the applications themselves. So in summary, uh, uh, I.O. devices are slow and uh, as a result, 
uh, we have to employ all kinds of mechanisms to deal with these speed issues. So we looked at three different ways for communicating with I/O slow I/O devices. The first one was polling based, where the CPU essentially busy waits, waiting for a slow I/O device to complete. The second one was interrupt based, where the CPU went off and did other things while the I/O operation was in progress. And the third one was DMA based, where you essentially offloaded slay of slow I/O to a different controller, and that controller was responsible for dealing with with slow I/O. And we looked at number of mechanisms to actually improve I.O. performance where it basically had to deal with buffering. So you had buffering on the device itself to deal with speed mismatches, you had buffering on the OS side to deal with speed mismatches and you also had a buffer cache where frequently accessed data is stored to allow you to deal with the slow device by reading or writing directly to a cache uh, before you may read or write to a device. And we looked at both a write through and a write back policy that you can implement in your cache that gave you a trade off between performance and reliability. The overall goal here is to improve the utilization of the CPU while still dealing with slow I/O devices. And keep in mind that there are many I/O devices on the machine, and all of them are essentially accessed through the system bus. So the system bus has to arbitrate between multiple ongoing I/Os on your machine and the CPU that's also accessing data from memory. So all of so which is why it's an important component in the in the overall system. So with that, we have uh, gone through very quickly, uh, or. Uh, uh, overview of key concepts of I.O. devices and how device drivers works at a very high level. And in the next class, I'm actually going to go into details of Minix and discuss how uh, Minix actually implements these concepts. And because this is a virtual class, the lecture uh, uh, is shorter than usual and I'm hoping to allow all of you to ask uh, questions uh, using an online Zoom mechanism or through Piazza so that we can actually have some discussion going because this has just been a lecture that I've delivered. There is going to be some opportunity for all of you to ask questions about the concepts I've covered here as well. So with that, I'm going to stop here and then we are going to uh, in the next class talk about Minix specific concepts.